Dr. Norman Vincent Peale is considered by most Americans to be a national treasure. He's known as minister to millions, confidant to captains and kings, and a lover of humanity. Dr. Peale is the author of 38 books, including The Power of Positive Thinking, an international bestseller that has sold almost 20 million copies. We had the distinct honor and privilege recently to spend some time with Dr. Peel and his wife, Ruth, in a beautiful setting in Ocala, Florida, as part of a national tour to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Foundation for Christian Living. Dr. Peel, you're responsible for shaping and influencing the lives of millions of people. Who's a major factor in shaping and influencing your life? Well, the lady that sits at my right had a much to do with that. Grove Patterson played an important part in your life uh, back as a newspaper man. What was it that he told you after a sermon that he saw you preach? Well, Grove Patterson was editor of the Detroit Journal, the Newark Evening News, and the Toledo Blade at the same time. He was probably one of the best after-dinner speakers in the Midwest. They tried to get him to run for the Senate and said he would be a shoe-in. But uh, he, he became a lifelong friend of mine and had much to do w with my early life in particular. I knew him until I was about 50 years of age. He told me when I went into the ministry that if I didn't do very well at it or didn't like it, uh, my old job was still waiting for me on the paper. And I noticed him in the congregation this day and pulled out all the stops because I wanted him to realize that his erstwhile reporter wasn't too bad in this role. And afterwards, I was shaking hands with people, and he came up to me and with a door look said, well, Norman, your old job's still waiting. <laughs> <laughs> Fortunately, he turned, it turned out to be not such a prophetic uh, statement. It's hard to believe that considering all the sermons and lectures that you've given, that they're all done extemporaneously. Well, I tell you, he works on a sermon uh, all week long and uh, makes an, an uh, outline of it. But then he leaves the outline on his desk in the study before he goes into the pulpit. And all of his um, presentation is extemporaneously. I think that's why he's learned how to tell stories. He, and most of his sermons have a story or two in them from everyday life. And to me, that's what makes them down to earth. I think you once said that every man, woman, and child has a rich story to tell. Some of them are seemingly dry wells, but if you keep probing, because some people are hesitant to tell their innermost feelings, and you have to probe without seeming to probe, just be friendly, and gradually it will emerge. Every human being has an interesting, even fascinating story, I do believe. You almost took a job in Los Angeles at a very large Methodist church, but instead you opted for the Marble Collegiate Church in New York. Tell us about that. Bill, I've been very fortunate in that every job I've ever had was at the bottom. And the bottom is a great place because the only direction you can go from the bottom is upward. And if you take a job that's up, high up, then you've got to lift it higher. But if you take one that's at the bottom and lift it reasonably, uh, you're doing all right. Uh, I was asked to come to this church in Los Angeles in 1932, I think it was. It was at that time 
credited with being the largest Methodist church in the world. It was at 8th and Hope Street, downtown in Los Angeles. And it had 3,300 individual seats, theater style, in the sanctuary. So that's a big crowd. And they had them full every Sunday. And Marble Church was very far down. It was the Depression, and New York City was and is the money capital of the nation, and it was acutely felt. But uh, I decided to take Marble Church because it was a tougher job than the Los Angeles Church. But well, that decision was not very easy. I remember uh, reading about it that that decision, like a lot of other decisions that you made in your life, you prayed a lot and it was almost like a, a bolt out of the blue where you suddenly realized the, the direction that you should take. Yeah, I, I, Bill, uh, that's an interesting story. I, I wrestled with this decision about a month and annoyed my wife by my indecision. She's very decisive. And I came home for lunch one day, and she said, you know what? You're not leaving this house until you arrive at a decision. We've gone over it, examined it from every viewpoint. Now a decision must be made. And she directed me to start praying. And I started about one o'clock and we prayed until about 4 p.m. Then I had a decision made for me. It was just like a light went on in my mind. And she said, have you arrived at a decision? I said, yes. Well, she said, what is the decision? I said, have you got a decision? She said, yes, <laughs> but no way am I going to tell you about it because it's your decision and I'll go with you to New York or Los Angeles or anywhere. So it was in my ballpark. <laughs> she didn't let you off the hook. <laughs> and I said, well, my decision is to go to New York. She said, go to the telephone and call the man up instantly and tell him that you're coming to his church. And the minute I did that, I knew it was a right decision. And I was in New York church for 52 years and never in 52 years regretted that decision. So decisions can be made in prayer if you stick to it and just don't mumble a few prayers and expect that to decide it you've got to stay with it and wrestle with the lord so to speak was that relationship the way it was or the way it is throughout your entire marriage now where you both would pray together on some of the important decisions yeah. that oh, happened. I, I would feel we both feel that you can get God's guidance through prayer uh, ideas will come into your mind that are not your ideas but they've come to you from uh, inspiration so that this was one of the most important ones after all, the church in New York was at a very low ebb, and we went there. And if we had 250 people in the congregation, uh, it, we were lucky when we first arrived. And it was a big church, and I thought to myself, why have they made balconies in churches? Nobody in them. So we struggled for a long time. And many times when we're talking with young pastors who are having a hard time in their churches, we tell them about our struggle. And we worked hard, and Norman spoke to every group that would ask him to it. But we finally got an uh, audience, congregation, and it stayed there with us for uh, 52 years. Maybe you'd like to know how we left. Yeah, that'd be fine, sure. You know, you get into a church 
where you know, maybe I say this humbly, but there was a popular preacher, Norman. So they came from all over the United States, in fact, all over the world to hear him, especially after his books became popular. So one Sunday we had been there for 52 years and one summer we went off on a summer vacation. And about August, Norman said to me, Ruth, suppose we don't go back. I said, don't go back. Well, no, he said, we have the staff in, in uh, place. Uh, the program is going well. They all believe in the thing that we're doing. Uh, just let's not go back. So that's what we did. We never went back. And the church went on as if there hadn't been a ripple. No last sermon, no retirement dinner, no gnashing of teeth and weeping. Uh, and um, a few people were surprised. Everybody was surprised. And a few people maybe were a little hurt. But the church, the program, the emphasis went on as if nothing had happened. Our conversation with Dr. Peel and his wife Ruth will continue in just a moment. Another decision you made had a dramatic impact on your ministry, and that was that if people weren't coming to the church, you would go to the people. Well, that's true. He would accept any invitation that came along, a Kiwanis club, a high school commencement, uh, the various rotary clubs and what have you, so that he would talk to people where they were. And um, I remember he went once to a, a businessmen's convention in New York City. and. Um, was impressed with the fact that not enough men were coming to church. So he talked with them about their problems and where they were and the pressures that they were having to deal with. One of the other things that you developed at that time was a philosophy that uh, you would not pray to fill the seats of church, but you would pray to fill the souls of people with the gospel of God. Bill, that is a wonderful statement. That is exactly what I did. And you have articulated it so plainly. That's the secret of success. You, success might have seemed to have been to fill the pews, but if you fill people, they will fill pews. But you don't fill them full of the truth to make them come to church but you fill them full in order that they may have real, meaningful, happy, worthwhile life. And I, I, had, a, I had a speaking agent in my church named Hal Pete. I went to him one day and I told him that I wanted to good outside in conventions. I, I figured that if I spoke to conventions, everybody who goes to a convention ultimately comes to New York as a visitor or many to live permanently. And I would fill up the church thereby. And he said, well, you can't pre preach a sermon at a secular convention. I said, I know you can't, but he said, if you take this subject matter and secularize it enough so that it wouldn't offend people of a, re a different religious faith. So he said, I'll send you out and see if you can do that. So he sent me up to Cattaraugus County, way up north, uh, to speak to a farmer's convention. And the man who met me at the Erie Railroad Station, I had to take a night train to get up there. He said, well, the boys must be running low on money to get a preacher. I don't know how you fit the bill. <laughs> if, you, if you pray, that's one thing, but the uh, speech, the principal speaker as a preacher, never had it in history. So I had taken a sermon and de-sermonized it enough 
that it was a speech, and I gave it, and on the way back to the train station, he said, you know, that was pretty good. Not bad at all. He said, uh, you could make a sermon out of that speech. <laughs> he didn't know that I'd made a speech out of a sermon. So I gradually worked up from the county level to the state level, to the regional level, to the national level, and I suppose I've made speeches to about as many business conventions in America as the next one. We've spoken to all kinds of conventions from the American Bankers Association to the Domino Pizza Convention. <laughs> what prompted you to begin this one-man crusade to bring the American businessman closer to Jesus? Well, I was invited one night to speak to about 300 young rising businessmen of New York City. That's the way they were built. And I sat between two nice fellows at the head table. So I said to the man on my right, uh, do you go to church? Where do you go to church? Well, he said, my grandfather was a leader in the Presbyterian Church in Scarsdale. And my father was an active member of the Presbyterian Church. I said, I didn't ask you about your grandfather or your father. I asked you where you went to church. Well, he said, I get around on Easter, maybe at Christmas, but I have my religion in my wife's name. And I turned to the fellow on my left and I said, where do you go to church? Well, he said, I live in White Plains. I go to the Episcopal Church on Easter, like Bill here. I don't even go Christmas, but I go Easter. I think uh, the Lord wants me to show up at least once a year. And I said to these fellows, how many would you say are out there in this audience, they said about 300. Well, I said, what percentage of them do you think are church-going men practicing Christians? And they kicked the question around, and they finally agreed on about 25%. Well, somehow or other, that irritated me, and I walked all the way after that meeting from 50th Street down to 10th Street where I lived, that's about two miles. Who are these guys that they think they're superior to the great Christian church? I said that Christianity undercord the free enterprise system. They have their jobs because of Christianity. And I worked with myself all the way down. That next day, I went to this fella, Hal, and told him I wanted to go into the speaking business. And I've been speaking to conventions for 60 years, because that happened about 60 years ago. And I saw the day when we had 60% men in the church and 40% women. Now, I want to make it clear, Bill, I'm not opposed to women, but I think that if you get the men, you'll get the women. It doesn't seem to work. If you get the women, you get the men. But if you get the men, the women are so surprised that they flock to church to see what what goes there. And this in turn will influence the children, of course. And you said that uh, a sales meeting is only one step away from a spiritual meeting. What do you mean by that? Yeah. Uh, I've spoken to a lot of sales meetings. It's the nearest thing to a Methodist or Baptist revival meeting that you can get. <laughs> 
because they come to these meetings because they want to do better. And a salesman learns that he, he does better if he is himself better. And I, I, I was speaking in Australia one time, and the biggest car salesman in Australia said, I'm a member of the Church of England here in Australia, but we don't mention it in secular meetings. But you Americans, you talk to salesmen and you always mention God and you even mention Jesus Christ. Why do you do that? He said, I'm in favor of it, but we don't do it. Why do you do it? Because I said, we don't think that a human personality can reach its greatest potential unless it is touched by God and Jesus Christ who can make a man or a woman into what he or she is supposed to be. He said, why don't you wake us up? Well, I said, why do you think we're here <laughs> talking in Australia? Our conversation with Dr. Peel and his wife, Ruth, will continue in just a moment. Give us a little bit of uh, background about the fact that the first draft of the power of positive thinking was rejected. And again, Ruth was instrumental in, uh, in, in bringing that to uh, She to picked shape. it out of the wastebasket and took it to a publisher. <laughs> I had faith in it. I knew that it was a good book. But I also want you to know that that was rewritten, I think, about five times. He worked awfully hard on that and put it away for about a year after the first uh, rejection so that you don't do these things easily, but you bring God into it and get a conviction of what's supposed to be in a book. And that's been in print ever since. Almost 20 million copies. Yes, you know? yes. But we had a celebration on the 35th anniversary and coming up pretty soon to the 40th. And the book was 186 weeks on the New York Times bestseller that's list. Right. At that time was a record. And it became almost an overnight, I guess, uh, success with people who, they must have been looking and striving for this kind of direction. What about the criticism from some members of the clergy that it was a, a get-ahead success type book and that it lacked Christian values? Well, what we found was a lot of those who criticized it really and truly had not read it. They were mouthing criticisms that they heard from one another. But Norman was ahead of his time. Uh, the phrase, the power of positive thinking, had never been used before. There again, I think he feels that the Lord gave him that phrase because it had helped him to change his thinking from negative to positive. And um, so that we went through a very difficult time in critical uh, analysis of that book. But we lived through it, and the thing to do is you don't answer your critics. You just believe in what you're doing and going on, go on and do it again. This criticism, I think, was good for me because it taught me how to live with criticism. And that's something that every human being needs to learn if they're the subject of criticism. I finally figured out that if the criticism is valid, you can learn from it. If it isn't valid, you forget it. And you never get mad at the critic. He may not like you, and he may even hate you. But if you continue to love him and pray for him and treat him fairly, you may make a friend of him. And some of my most violent critics became later my best friends because of that attitude. I figured that out for myself 
but it was hard to do. But if I get criticism today, I immediately know how to handle it. One of the things that I read about that period of your life, uh, that you not only outlived your critics, but you outloved them. <laughs> well, I tried to do that, yeah. You talked earlier about the fact that you have printer's ink on your fingers, and that's why you prefer, most of the time, the printed word. What's your feelings about today's TV evangelists? Well, the trouble with TV evangelism is that it's too expensive. Maybe it's not too expensive, but it's expensive, period. So you have to utilize part of your time to harangue the listener and the viewer to give you some money. I tried that once. I had CBS uh, for, for about uh, 13 segments, I think, 13 Sundays. And I determined that I wouldn't ask the audience for a nickel, not for a cent. But it cost us about $800,000, and we couldn't afford that. I got, I was speaking for Guidepost magazine. I think there's another factor in this. The printed word, no matter whether it's in a book or a booklet, uh, is with you, stays with you. And if you have a problem, maybe you remember what you've read in that uh, piece, and you can go back to it and read it again, so that it gives you something to live by. And I think there is a much greater permanency in the printed wood word than in the uh, television presentation I've, and that's what Norman's concentrated I've on. I've had many uh, this kind of experience. A mother gives her son the power of positive thinking when he goes away to college and he takes it and never cracks it for four years. And maybe he's out of college for another four years, and then he gets into the difficulties of human life. He begins, to, he begins to encounter difficulty. So one night he's sitting there thinking what he can do, and he sees a book, The Power of Positive Thinking, and he says, Mom gave me that when I went to college. So he takes it down and he starts to read it, and it satisfies him with its sensibilities, and it turns his life around. Now, if he heard his speech, it's gone with the wind. Although I believe in speaking because you activate people, you motivate them, but the printed page has authority I saw it in the paper. It was printed. And I saw it in a book. It means authoritative. It means it must be right, too. Yeah. It, it, most people feel that way. Yeah. Of course, TV evangelism has come upon some disfavor recently because of some problems with some of the ministers. Do you think it'll ever make a comeback the way it was before? Well, yes, it'll make a comeback because it's the greatest medium for communication known to man at the present time. And the men who didn't live up to their ministerial vows and purposes. Uh, power corrupts. I think it's uh, dangerous to anybody. In business, we read about people who formerly were highly respected, and they one by one go to jail because they make too much money, and they become powerful. 
and they vaunt themselves up to a position where they weren't meant to be. I think that we have to have a new emphasis on values in this country and really around the world. Uh, we're seeing so many things that are happening in the world that we didn't dream would happen in our lifetime. And it all has to do with uh, values. Uh, I think there's a new emphasis in our country. And I believe that your baby boomer generation is looking much now for uh, an emphasis on values. And we're finding a lot of baby boomers who've made it materially, but they're empty on the inside. And uh, so they want to get a hold of something that fills that emptiness, but also speaks to the everyday pressures of their business life, their family relationships, the dealing with their children, etc. And so, there, there's about 80 million baby boomers in the United States. It's about a third of the population. Norman's just finished read, uh, writing a book uh, that will be out in the um, not too long uh, called The Power of Positive Living. And it's uh, sort of geared a little bit toward the baby boomers, of course, everybody. But the idea that values are there, they need to rediscover them again. I put the title Try Believing. It works wonders, but the editor uh, uh, in the publishing house, acting on his uh, great authority, changed the title to The Power of Positive Living. I saw a bumper sticker the other day that indicated uh, about a yuppie game to accumulate as many things as you can before you die. Do you think that mentality and that emphasis on materialism has a lot to do with the drug problem today? I think it's a matter of the fact that uh, uh, the values, as we've talked about it, are not there. And uh, the continuity within a family is, uh, needs to have an additional emphasis uh, these days. There's been an entire change in family values and today. We have working parents, both parents working, single uh, parents, latchkey children. What's your feelings on that in today's society? That's very true. And we all need to take a part in that to find a solution. It's not going to be easy. But there again, if they have a spiritual uh, uh, answer for many of these pressures, it makes all the difference in the world. I also think that there's a new emphasis all through this career of Norman's. I've had a feeling as though the greatest career for a woman is being a wife. And that takes a lot of doing, and it takes an awful lot of patience, and that's why I call it a career. The second greatest career for a woman is being a mother. Now, she can do both of those things, and she can still go out on the outside and have a career of her own. I talk about this because I've done that myself. But I've still, I still feel that the greatest uh, fulfillment for me is being a wife for Norman. But uh, I've gone out and had a career on my own. We've uh, come just recently from a, a committee meeting where I had to attend because I happened to be vice president of the organization. And Norman went along what do you suppose, as my spouse. <laughs> so that we have a perfect understanding between us. I have my own listing in Who's Who in America. I've had a career, but when we're together, it's Norman's career that's the important thing. But there are places where he's known only as Ruth Stafford Peel's spouse. <laughs> so we have a great time talking about each other. Now, uh, we've brought up our children that way. Uh, we brought up our children to trust each other, or that we as parents trusted them, and they knew that we trusted them. But we had a family relationship, I don't know whether you're interested or not, but when they were growing up as little kids, Norman had a, con a continued story that he would tell every night at dinner. Larry, Harry, and Perry, and their magic airplane. The kids loved it, 
and every night they'd have we'd have the blessing at the dinner table and they'd say, oh, come on daddy tell us the next story about Larry Harry Perry and his magic airplane see the airplane they could put in their pocket then they could take it out and blow on it and then they could go any place top of the trees up on the clouds he didn't have any idea what he was going to tell in that story well the children were so fascinated with it that I found recently that they started telling the same story to their children when they grew up so that those are the things that help in a family relationship and we worked at it all we worked at it all the time as we were bringing up our children in all the years of your association with the church and its far-flung ministries that you're involved with now you have a magazine and the radio shows and publisher of books and things like that and yet you haven't really taken much compensation all that time well that's very true we uh, used Norman's sermons originally and now his writings in the Foundation for Christian Living that we publish. And uh, Guidepost Magazine, of course, has their complete editorial uh, staff. Uh, but we've had a great time in uh, getting an idea, working at it hard, getting it uh, where we knew it was going to fly, and then turning it over to the best people we can, always keeping our fingers on it. I, I tell you, I was president of Guidepost from its inception until about three years ago. Then at a meeting of the board of directors, I became generous and suggested that Ruth be uh, president because she has administrative ability that I don't have. And I thought that these men on the board of directors were conservative, hard-headed businessmen and that they wouldn't go for a woman. But I was astonished at their alacrity with which they received this suggestion and they unanimously elected her president and invented a, a title for me which means nothing, chairman. <laughs> well, I tell you, I, I, I think of ourselves as a team, or myself. He's the creative person, I'm the organizer. And together, we respect each other's um, strengths, we undergird each other's weaknesses. Now, Norman talked in the beginning about he couldn't make decisions. Well, that's true. He can't make decisions today. And it drives... Well, I think I've done pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> but sometimes it drives me up the wall. Because I can easily, with a set of circumstances, tell you what I think is the right answer. But I have learned, when he should make a decision, to patiently sit. I have spent years of my life <laughs> listening to Norman trying to make a decision because he brings out all the details of why it should be I want to so. analyze it. That's right. Well, then one day I got an inspiration and I realized that the reason he is such a good counselor and can talk to people about their lives and their problems is because he has that kind of a mind. He wants to have all the issues connected with a decision. So that helped me in the patience that I need when he's trying to make a decision. But let me tell you, in June, we're, June 1990, we're going to celebrate our 60th wedding anniversary. It's no easier today than it was 60 years ago. <laughs> it doesn't get any better. So obviously it's worked 60 years. Back in, I guess it was 1930, you met and were married in Syracuse, New York. Yes. And uh, about two years before that, I was holding a committee meeting of students in the university after service one Sunday morning. And it was in the front of the church. And I was standing looking out toward the principal street of Syracuse, Genesee Street, and the great doors of the church were out there. And suddenly the doors were impatiently thrown open, and a girl stood framed in the beauty of an 
autumn day in October. I had never seen her before. I did not know her name or anything about her. But in that moment, I knew that she was the girl for me. Now, I made a decision instantly, <laughs> and I didn't have you to help me. <laughs> but in fact, it took me two years to sell her on the idea. But we, now we've been married 60 years. Well, I was in college, and I remember in our sorority, there were five of us that were very close. And in our bull sessions and talking together, one thing we all agreed about was we would never marry a preacher, a minister. Well, I was the first one to succumb, and I married a minister, and then the second one came along, and she married a minister till four of these five girls all married ministers. And the fifth girl married a man by the name of Parson. Oh, God. <laughs> but uh, I'll tell you one story about uh, Norman, if I may. He's told you one about me. Uh, we, had, we were married in the church where he was the pastor in Syracuse. My friends were there. I'd been through college. And um, the place was packed. Here was their minister who was getting married. Well, as we walked out of the church, the ceremony was over. We got into the limousine waiting for us to drive away. And I thought, surely, after all this detail, and cetera, Norman will have something romantic to say to me now. You know what he said? There was such a big crowd in that church, it's too bad we couldn't take up a collection. <laughs> so you see, I never know in living with Norman what's going to happen next. Would your life be different if you started your ministry today? No, it wouldn't be different, Bill, because the essence of the message is that a man came to this world one time, who said that his mission was in the following words, I am come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. And I have discovered that people who accept Jesus Christ into their lives as the rule and guide of their lives are the happiest people that I've ever known and the most successful people because his presence exercises, casts out the failure elements in personality. I am with you always, even to the end of the world. The human error element is in me and in everybody. The mistake tendency. But he is so wise and that he never makes mistakes. And I, I, he says, I'm with you always. Therefore, I can greatly reduce my mistake tendency if I stay close to him because he is ultimate wisdom and ultimate rightness. And that message is as real today as it was 50 years ago. Yes, and Just me, as real. And let me tell you one thing that we devised 50 years ago, and we're still doing it. And I think it's one of the most important things of all. Uh, you remember in the Protestant church, they would tell you to pray. They would tell you to read the Bible. They would tell you to get God's guidance, etc. But they didn't give you a one, two, three of how you did it. So we sat down together and we said, Norman, we must have some very down-to-earth practical suggestions telling people how to pray, telling people how to read the Bible, etc. Now, we did that in booklets. Our Foundation for Christian Living is celebrating our 50th anniversary in 1990. And we started this idea many, many years ago. We're still doing it. We're still uh, publishing Norman's messages and booklets that tell you how to pray, how to read the Bible. We have a, 
a club called the Positive Thinkers Club. And every month, Norman writes a letter telling how you put positive thinking into practice in your everyday life based on a spiritual uh, technique and uh, value. So that we've combined these uh, things that Norman has preached always in helping people with the written and printed word. And uh, we send them around the world. Uh, we had a, an expert in condensing books, take the power of positive thinking, and he condensed it into a booklet of 58 pages. Now we're in the process of completing a distribution of five million copies of that condensed edition of the power of positive thinking. The Boys Clubs of America, for instance, wrote us and asked us if they could have 300,000 copies of that condensed edition. Well, of course, we had to raise the money in order to give them that number. But that's the kind of thing that we're combining his message and the printed word, and that's the way we work together as a team. I believe that, that we can, all of us, live a better life and live a more constructive life successfully if we are led by our thought processes rather than our emotional processes. And if a person gets mad and filled with hate, that person is being directed by uncontrolled emotion. But if you think coolly, objectively, dispassionately, you adhere to rightness in decisions and what you do. And I was making a speech one day in West Virginia to a coal convention with back in the days when coal was a great industry. And I, I said that the closer you stay to the Jesus, the better you think. And the president of one of those big coal companies down there had made a little table ornament. What would Jesus do? And he told me later that he distributed some 3,000 of those were sitting on desks all around West Virginia. What would Jesus do? And in industrial conflict with the labor unions, for example, they'd look at that, what would Jesus do about this? And immediately, all uh, emotional factors leave it, and it's cold, not cold, but dispassionate thought and the labor management situation grew better because 3,000 of the leading businessmen of West Virginia were looking at that thing. What would Jesus do? Our conversation with Dr. Peel and his wife Ruth will continue in just a moment. We're talking here today, and uh, is this the real Dr. Peel? Is his enthusiasm like this all the time? so enthusiastic or is there a side of him that we don't see oh no he's always enthusiastic <laughs> now uh, I don't say that he doesn't get depressed sometimes but and I and have negative thoughts I say that sometimes he can write about positive thinking uh, so uh, uh, convincingly is because once in a while he preaches or he, he thinks negatively and when he realizes the process that he himself goes through in changing his thoughts and his vision from negative to positive, then he writes about it. And he finds that everybody else can do the same if they'll follow the same technique. So really, I mean, Dr. Peel, he's real. I mean, this is what you see what is what you get with Dr. Peel. Is what you're oh, this is what you get with Dr. Peel. You're absolutely right. Number, he's very humble. He's very down to earth. It has to be practical, but it has to be filled with the gospel and the love of Jesus Christ. 
How would you like to be remembered, Dr. Field? <laughs> well, I'd like to be remembered, period. <laughs> and uh, I, I think all of us would like to be remembered. But as to how I'd like to be, I'd like for thousands of people to say, he was a blessing in my life. He turned my life around by leading me to the Lord Jesus Christ. And he made the greatest contribution when he did that. I'd like to have that all on my tombstone. I also think that ought to be there. He loved people. He sees the potential in everyone. And he really and truly loves people. I buried a man recently, an artist. He was a good artist. His first painting sold for $10 and $15, and later they sold for $15,000. And they buried him outside of his studio uh, under a big rock, a huge boulder. And it simply said on that boulder, chiseled into the stone, God knows I tried. Well, that impressed me. And I think I'd, I'd go on with that on my own tombstone. God knows he tried to lead thousands of people to the source of life which is one word, Jesus. Perhaps more than any other single minister, Dr. Norman Vincent Peale has helped shape and influence the lives of countless people around the globe. As President Reagan said when he presented the Presidential Medal of Freedom to Dr. Peale, with a deep understanding of human behavior and the role of God in their lives, Dr. Peale has originated a philosophy of happiness that has helped millions of people find new meaning in their lives. Dr. Norman Vincent Peale, a man to be cherished as a national treasure for what he is, a man of God, a true American, and a lover of mankind. I want to thank Dr. Norman Vincent Peale and his wife Ruth for spending this time with us today and sharing their thoughts and feelings on God's message. I hope your lives uh, will be as enriched as mine has been for this time we spent together. Thank you for being with us. You're somebody created in the image of God to be somebody. You'll never be happy until you start being what you were born to be. If you can believe If you can believe it, you can do the impossible. You can do anything.